So, good afternoon. I, well, my, my name is Guillermo Castilla. I'm a Spanish forest engineer and I work in Canada. And I'm at the University of Calgary. So I'm going to show you one more approach. And I believe that after my talk, there is one more. So we have a, no, this is a, an exciting time because it's clearly this is a, one of the needs in, within Geovia that uh, needs to be tackled and uh, well and the fact that there are several people working in the same thing is, is encouraging because hopefully in the end we will figure it out. Um, I wanted to show you something that have in, in the final slides but for some reason I cannot animate it so I cannot show you and and I put it in the back because I thought that uh, I would need to go there but the thing is, I could start with the last slide of, or the last, second last slide of Tim, because one, one of the problems that he mentioned, one of the caveats is the problem of using a pre-existing map as a reference. And, and this is an important thing, and, and that what I wanted to explain in, in that slide, the problem with using a pre-existing map to assess the accuracy of uh, your map, uh, assumes that those polygons are real entities. And, of course, when we talk about the uh, buildings, roads, railways, yeah, there is a, a, a clear correspondence, but we are talking about land cover patches. This is very far away to, from, from, from being true. So the, the fact of the matter is that land cover patches are fiat objects. They are created by the analyst, be it a machine or a person. And you have the same image, the same legend, the same protocol, the same minimum mapping unit, minimum mapping with you have um, uh, two different machines with the same algorithm, different parameters, or two interpreters. The likelihood that they will arrive to the same partition of that image is zero. They will be different. Therefore, you uh, when you use a reference map, uh, a pre-existing map as a reference, what you are doing is maybe assessing the reference of the, uh, and the accuracy of that reference, but it's not a good source for, for uh, assessing the quality of your own map. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to go quickly. So this is an overview of what I want to talk. It's basically the the why, the how, and the what. And talking about the why, this is uh, the map that triggers uh, all work in, in this framework. So basically, we have a, a land cover polygon map of the entire uh, province of Alberta, which is, uh, as a reference, is the size of France, or in Brazil, is the size of Minas Gerais. And um, so it's a, it's a very large area. So we have over 2 million polygons and it use, uh, that were created using Landsat uh, raster imagery. So just, just for reference, if um, we zoom in, in one of the areas, th this is the, the main input raster that we use to create this map. So we apply the Geovia uh, spatial generalization algorithm where we use the original image that was used to, to get this classification plus other sources of uh, GIS information so that in the end we convert this uh, relatively noisy raster uh, map into a cleaner polygon product as you can see there. So well in the end after doing that we, we ended up with uh, this huge map and we had to say something to our users about the quality of, of the map. And obviously, the confusion matrix is not enough for that. And since uh, this is uncharted terri territory, well, we, we, we try to, to explore it uh, on our own. And this is the outcome of that exploration that I'm going to show you now. So don't get me wrong. I, I and nothing against the, the confusion matrix. It's a, it's a great tool, actually. This is the confusion matrix or the final confusion matrix of, of our map. At the, we have three, three hierarchical levels. This is the, the higher level with only six classes. But anyways, the, 
with the confusion matrix, you, you, you reply or you give answer to two very important questions, but when, we, when your units are, are, are referenced in your map are not pixels but polygons, the story changes quite a bit. And well, I'm gonna I'm not gonna dwell on this because uh, Tim has more or less uh, talking about this. So, most important thing is that each polygon in the map is deemed to represent a patch. And what is a patch? A patch is simply it depends on the legend uh, you have. So, but given a, a set of Lancor classes, a patch is an area that is relatively homogeneous and different from the surroundings. And that means that you had to assess this as a whole in context what is outside. So, so obviously you need more than a confusion matrix because the relatively in the definition of a, a patch means that then within the patch there can be heterogeneity. So, well, Tim talk about that. So again, I'm not going to dwell on this. And also the polygon has to make sense as a patch. So for example, in the example, we have this polygon with label forest, and we see that thematically this polygon is correct, but as a representation of a patch, it does not make sense. So obviously, we have to go beyond the confusion matrix and, and do more parameters. And, and and we believe that there are kind of three dimensions to, to object-based accuracy. The first one will be thematic. So is the interior of the polygon uh, covered by the land core class that the map is saying? But also there is what we call structural accuracy because a land cover map, a polygon land cover map, is a mosaic of polygons that are deemed to represent a patch mosaic in a landscape. So how well does this mosaic represent the spatial structure of that landscape that we mapped? This is a very important question and cannot be answered with a confusion matrix. And, and finally, well, we, we also need to, to, to know whether the outlines of the polygons are relatively close to the transition of boundaries that, and between different land cover classes. Um, so, with that in mind, these three dimensions plus the area-based uh, parameters that we still need, because we always will need to report by the area what is the proportion of each class that is actually covered by that class, so we cannot escape from that. Uh, we, we gave it a thought on how could we derive all this set of parameters using a single process. Because, again, the problem we have is we have this huge area we had little money, um, little manpower, and, and we had to come up with a, 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 an efficient process. And, and this is the outcome of this exercise. So basically what we do is very simple. We select a number of polygons from, from our map throughout the, the entire extent of the, the map, and for each of these polygons, we visualize it uh, using very high resolution imagery. And we, on the one hand, we assign a land cover call, but also we will perform some geometric corrections if that polygon is, for example, not representing fully a patch or is, uh, or it considers several patches. So, uh, so we will uh, split it. So we not only uh, uh, make uh, land cover calls, but also make geometric corrections. And once we have the final edited version of this uh, validation layer with these selected polygons, we simply intersect it with the original map, and uh, for, uh, using a series of script, we derive automatically all these parameters. So. The three classic components of accuracy assessment, sampling design, response design, and analysis. I'm going to talk briefly about each. So in the case of the sampling design, again, our sampling unit is polygons from the map. And why? Because what I just said before I started my, my, my PowerPoint presentation, because we cannot use a, a, a pre-existing map, a reference, because patches are not 
there. You create them and, and then it will not make sense. So we, we use our sampling units around polygons and what we do is we, this map is a mosaic of uh, several Landsat scenes that were classified independently. So we use our primary sampling units, the Landsat scenes. And, and within each of the selected scenes, we, we select randomly a set of polygons and we use stratified random sampling. So we apply a 1% intensity. We start picking polygons until we complete a 1% of each of the land cover classes in the scene. So since we are going to uh, perform geometric corrections, we don't want uh, uh, sample polygons that are adjacent because their correction could overlap. And this would complicate a lot the, the process. So we had to, we, we, we search for a tool that could uh, enable us to, to set the constraint that no two, adjacent, no two polygons in the sample can be adjacent. Well, after a little search, we found out that there was no such a tool, or at least we didn't find you know of, uh, of such a thing, raise your hand, but we had to create our own tool. And this uh, we're going to make available for everyone to use uh, through our website when once we get this paper published so this is a just yes, and this is a one of these tiles that we use uh, each tile is completely as i said uh, encompassed in a landsat scene and using this tool in this particular case we obtain this set of polygons and i didn't mention before that we make uh, we separate polygon by size. So we had two groups of polygons, those that are normal, that have a normal size, and those that are very large. And, and the reason for that is that for very large polygons, uh, we don't assess those uh, structural accuracy parameters for two reasons. One, it, it would be very time consuming because they are very large. Imagine trying to, to complete or correct the, the boundary of this. And the second is that these very large polygons are a little more than a 1% of the number of polygons in the map. So in the end, the weight in the structural accuracy parameter of this polygon will be negligible. So um, respond designs. Basically, we use, well, some, some of you may be aware that there is a, a very nice plugin in RGIS that is called R2S. Raise your hand if you know that uh, plugin, Arc2Earth. No? Okay, Thomas, okay. Well, this plugin basically allows you to put inside the ArcMap window of RGIS Google Earth imagery or Google Maps. So basically, with that, what, what can you do with that? You can digitize in our map, and you have as a backdrop the, the Google Earth imagery. So we, we use that. When, when the Google Earth imagery is too coarse, we have also in-house and ortho photos that we can pull from, from a catalog. So another nice feature of uh, this system is that you can navigate from one polygon in the sample to the next using simply a click of a button. And this is done with this uh, data-driven pages tool in RG. So it saves a lot of time. You just click a button, you, 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 can, you make your corrections. When you are done, click the button, go to the next point. And of course, um, this uh, split in the polygon into parts or reshaping it, plus entering the, the, the land cover attributes for each of these new polygons is done using the inbuilt tools within our map. And finally, we have a, a very lengthy manual with very detailed instructions with all the protocol to do, uh, and do these corrections. And this we are going to sometime in the near future make available. So this is, for example, this is the flow chart that the interpreters have to follow for each of these polygons. So basically, the story is you visualize the polygon. If the polygon is heterogeneous, you break it down into homogeneous part larger than the minimum mapping unit. That is, in our case, is for the most part two hectares. And, uh, and then you assign a land cover uh, class. And if that 
part it could be made a self-contained patch because there was something missing that is not too big and we have threshold for that the the interpreter will complete it so um, you see a couple of, of examples and I'm gonna go very quickly because I have realized I'm running out of time so this is uh, how it looks and this is uh, what the interpreter did. So basically, this polygon was split in three parts. And this is because this is a self-contained patch. He called it a whole, meaning that it's a full part. And this, is, and this part here is a part of a mar larger agricultural field. And it's called a part. And this one is smaller than the minimum mapping unit. And, and then when we have a small sliver and parts, we tell them not to bother to put a label because it is negligible in terms of area. So uh, I'm gonna skip this one. It's more or less same stuff. So just to say that the, once we had this uh, edited uh, validation layer, we intersected with the original map, and we, through a series of scripts, we derived the uh, not only the confusion matrix but the other uh, parameters. So these are the parameters that we study. So area-based semantic, polygon-based semantic, structural, and positional. So for each one of them, we have a process that is automated, and you obtain a number for that. And these are the results that we, we got for this map. This is, uh, as I said, uh, uh, with six classes, we got an 80% accuracy. We have at the lowest level, we have 18 classes. The accuracy is obviously lower. But the, interestingly, the polygon-wise likelihood, uh, so the overall accuracy polygon-wise is a smaller number. And the reason for that is, and this is something that I think is new, that no one has done before, we divided, we have uh, around 6,000 validation polygons that we have uh, checked. So we, we group them in sizes and, and, and run the process and find out that the smaller the polygon, the lower the accuracy. Since we have a bunch of small polygons in the map, that's the reason why the, the polygon-wise likelihood is, the, the, the overall accuracy is smaller. And uh, the other interesting thing, the third item, we realized that many of our polygons in reality are not patches with, with our legend. So, and then the problem we, we found that is because of the spatial generalization algorithm, not, uh, well, trying to be conservative, we have a lot of small polygons that are cluttered, that are more or the same. And, uh, well, and this, uh, uh, thanks to this process, we can detect it and quantify it. And, uh, well, and the, the consequence for that is that we cannot recommend to use this map for any kind of landscape pattern analysis, it would be very bad. And, and the saying about this, so it's a consequence of the other. Since m there are a lot of polygons that are in reality not patches, there are a lot of outlines that are also, that have the same land cover on both sides, they are nothing. And, but those that actually represent true land cover boundaries, they have a good accuracy because, again, this is a, a map that is 1 to 150,000 scale if it was printed, and our target accuracy for, for boundaries was two lands of pixels, so we are within that. So, to just to sum it up, we have created or we are proposing a framework that would allow you to assess the accuracy of very large land cover polygons layers using a single streamlined process. It takes around three minutes to, to process uh, one of these polygons. And everything except for the interpretation is automated. And well, we hope that uh, you will find it interesting. We, in, the, in the short future, we're going to upload some of this information for you to assess. Thank you.